A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, 33 and a half hours from New York to Paris. Although this was not the first transatlantic flight ever, this was the first conducted from one major city to the other. For this accomplishment, Lindbergh won the Ortig Prize of $25,000 and the adoration of the public and the press. When his story first graced the headlines of all major newspapers, it pushed another significant historical event right off the front page. However, this competing headline was not about the glories of winning and aviation, but was about devastating loss. Two days before Lindbergh's famous journey, the town of Bath, Michigan experienced tragedy. One of the largest mass murders in American history had claimed 38 of its children and six of its adults, including the mastermind behind it. Most people never heard of the Bath Massacre, thanks to Lindbergh's flight, but the devastation haunted generations of Michigan families. On May 18, 1927, a local man named Andrew Kehoe bombed the consolidated schoolhouse in Bath with the intention of killing all 236 children inside. And what did the children do to incur his wrath? Absolutely nothing. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Andrew Kehoe. When the Bath Consolidated School was blown apart at 9.45 a.m., on May 18, 1927, the blast lifted the entire north wing of the building about four feet into the air. The downward pressure of the explosion pushed out the building's walls, causing the roof and second floor to collapse, crushing the children and teachers below. Some died instantly, while others lay bleeding and broken on the ground waiting for help. Parents and townspeople rushed to the site and began tearing at the rubble, trying to unearth the victims who were pinned down by the broken roof, walls, and beams. There were arms, legs, and some heads sticking out of the pile. Most were unrecognizable because they were covered in plaster, dust, and blood. If parents found their wounded children amongst the debris, they tried to carry them away to get medical attention, not realizing every doctor and nurse in town had rushed to the school. Rescuers laid the lifeless bodies of those who were killed on a grassy hill adjacent to the school. Parents who arrived to find their children among the dead mourned them in agony. As people raced to get supplies and help, they noticed local farmer Andrew Kehoe's truck barreling toward the front of the school. One neighbor who saw him 
said that he could clearly see Andrew's face, and it was, quote, contorted into a ghastly grin, like the rictus of a corpse. When Andrew's flatbed truck pulled up on the front lawn of the school, the scene was chaotic. He parked alongside the wreckage, where he spotted the school superintendent, Emery Hike, helping students escape the damaged building. Andrew made no move to get out of the car and help with the rescue. Instead, he motioned for Hike to come over to the car. Andrew grabbed Hike and seized a shotgun from the floor of his truck. He then fired into a load of dynamite in the rear seat, blowing himself and Hike to bits. Body parts of the men scattered amongst the trees and ground. Andrew had created a sort of IED, an improvised explosive device, in the back of his truck from shovels, metal parts of old farm equipment, and rusted tin cans. He had loaded the parts into the back with the dynamite, which, when it exploded, became lethal projectiles. An eight-year-old child, who only moments earlier had emerged relatively unharmed from the rubble, was killed instantly by a piece of the flying metal. Two others died due to the blast from the car, and several others were permanently damaged and disfigured. According to Harold Schechter's book, Maniac, which details the tragic events in Bath, quote, there is a legal term for a device maliciously designed to explode and destroy life or property, especially a concealed or disguised bomb. Originating in the early 19th century, and found even today in the criminal codes of many states, it captures with chilling precision Andrew Kehoe's monstrous climactic act. He had taken his pickup truck and made it into an infernal machine. In the immediate aftermath of the bombing, state police arrived at the scene and halted the villagers from removing any more debris while they checked for more explosives. In the basement, they found extensive and elaborate electrical wiring that Kehoe had soldered together and attached to the explosives. By sheer luck, a short circuit in the wiring had stopped an additional 500 pounds of dynamite from exploding. 36 children and two teachers died that day in the schoolhouse explosion. In the days after the bombing, even more victims would fall to their wounds. All told, 38 children and six adults, including Kehoe, would be counted among the dead and countless others were permanently injured. It was reported that nearly every family in the area had someone killed or injured in the blast. Had the entire bomb gone off, all 236 children in attendance at that school would have been killed. An entire generation of Bath's children would have been lost forever. Andrew Kehoe was born on February 1, 1872, in Tecumseh, Michigan. He was the firstborn son in a family of 13 to devout Catholic parents and, as such, was treated as a favored child. His father was a successful farmer who had immigrated to America from Ireland at the age of eight. After his first wife died, leaving him with three daughters, he remarried in 1866. He and his second wife had nine children, six girls and three boys. One of them 
being Andrew. Andrew loved to tinker with mechanical and electrical devices, and he excelled at physics in school. And although he was active in his community, even performing comedy skits at the local farm meetings, he was also said to be arrogant and an introvert, often coming across to most as, well, cold. After a long illness, Andrew's mother died in 1890, when he was 18 years old. Not much is known about Andrew's life for the next eight years, except that he helped around the farm. In 1898, after his father married again, Andrew left home. Although Andrew told others that he had graduated from an agricultural college during this period of time, there is no record of this in the college archives. He eventually made his way to Iowa and then St. Louis, working as a lineman and electrician. When he was living in Missouri, he was electrocuted while working on a power line and suffered a severe fall that left him semi-conscious for almost two months. His family reported that his entire personality changed after that accident. We have spoken about how TBI, traumatic brain injury, can affect the personality and decision-making abilities in those afflicted. Before I knew of this incident in Andrew's life, as well as a later head trauma that occurred on his farm, I was initially puzzled at how his psychological state seemed to shift dramatically. But after learning this, it made sense. Many crimes of interpersonal violence are precipitated by some type of extreme stress, loss, or some sort of traumatic event in the offender's life. We call it a precipitating factor. When I first started to study this particular case, I thought that situations that occurred closer to the tragedy his eventual dire financial situation and his wife's ill health were making him stressed and could have triggered the catastrophe. This information about his brain injury certainly fills in a lot of gaps. According to a 2009 article in the Journal of Clinical Neuroscience, aggression after TBI is common, although it is usually seen within three months of the injury. The aggressions can be verbal, which is the most common, or they can be physical. What we know now is that Andrew's TBI was not only severe, but he suffered it as an adult at a time when the drugs now used to combat brain swelling did not exist. If an adult's brain swells from trauma, there is no outlet for the increased pressure to be relieved. An adult skull cannot expand. Therefore, the pressure on the brain causes damage to the brain. Medical records and witness accounts of Andrew's coma after the electrocution accident range from several weeks to three months. Suffice it to say, it was a serious brain injury. But Andrew's electrocution and multiple head traumas, while significant, were not the only factors that contributed to his subsequent crimes. After his accident, Andrew went back to live with his father and his stepmother and their new daughter, Andrew's half-sister. He did not get along with his stepmother at all and was unhappy with his new family so unhappy that the newspapers later reported that he had killed his half-sister's pet cat. In 1911, his stepmother was cooking on her gasoline stove when it exploded. According to Andrew's earliest biographer, Monty Ellsworth, Andrew was home in another room when the stove blew up and did not do much to help his stepmother. After watching her burn for a while, he eventually got a pail of water and threw it on her. Now, if you know anything about a gasoline fire, 
which I suspect the mechanically inclined Andrew did, you know that you do not throw water on a gasoline fire. You douse it with flour or powder or a blanket. Water just spreads the oil and causes the fire to spread. And that is what the water Andrew threw on his stepmother did, quote, liquefying what little skin she had left. After his father and half-sister joined to help put out the fire, Andrew went to the nearest neighbor who had a telephone and asked them to call the doctor. The neighbor later reported that he seemed calm and unbothered when she asked him if someone was sick. She said that he was very matter-of-fact when he told her, no, that his stepmother was burned. In truth, his stepmother was dying an agonizing death down the road and would only survive the next two hours. The neighbor had no idea how serious the situation was until Andrew asked her to also call a priest. This explosion was initially written off as an accident. However, after the Bath Massacre years later, people wondered if that was truly what happened or if Andrew played a much more sinister role. Eight months after his stepmother died, Andrew married Ellen Agnes Price, also known as Nellie, in May of 1912. They were both considered to be older when they married. He was 40 and she was 37, and both were the children of Irish immigrants. They settled in at his father's farm in 1912, and all was well until their local priest came to the farm one day and asked for a donation of $400 to help build a new church. Andrew not only refused, but threatened him with physical violence and ordered the priest off his land. He never attended church ceremonies there again. His troubles with the community continued when he bought cattle from a neighbor. Andrew allowed the animals to eat wet clover, which made them very sick, and two of the animals died. After he skinned the animals and sold their hides, he went to his neighbor and demanded half of his money back. The neighbor refused, and even though the cattle was healthy when he bought them, Andrew was convinced that he had been defrauded. He never spoke to the neighbor again. So when Nellie's relative died and left an 80-acre farm in Bath vacant, the couple saw an opportunity for a fresh start. Andrew and Nellie agreed to purchase the house and farm in Bath for $12,000 from Nellie's family and moved there almost immediately. They sold the Kehoe family house, and with that money, put a down payment of $6,000 on the property. Nellie's family owned the mortgage, and each month, Andrew would send $360 to Nellie's family. In Bath, Andrew and Nellie were given a warm welcome. The townspeople remembered Nellie from her childhood there. Andrew showed his usefulness to the town early on, fixing or installing anything mechanical his neighbors might need. The couple also became active members of many of the social clubs there. Although Andrew was known as a useful member of the community, the farmers did notice some peculiarities that he had. For example, while most would work their farms in dirt-covered overalls, Andrew rode his tractor in a business suit and polished shoes. If his hands or suit became dirty or too sweaty, he would run home to change. His neighbor described his barn as being cleaner than most houses, with every tool perfectly in place. Andrew's neighbors recalled numerous times when his behavior pointed to what we now know as signs of OCD and or OCPD. Let's look at the difference between those two disorders. 
Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD, is classified as an anxiety disorder, and Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder, OCPD, is classified as a personality disorder. According to the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, both are mental health disorders that share similar names. So distinguishing between the two can be difficult. However, the clinical definitions of these disorders are different. People with OCD have obsessive, intrusive, and usually unpleasant and unwanted repetitive thoughts known as obsessions. They may also feel compelled to repeat behaviors, which are known as compulsions. People with OCPD may be excessively focused on order and perfection and perform behaviors they are compelled to do. People with OCPD may face challenges understanding others' points of view, have difficulty hearing constructive criticism, and or exhibit patterns of extreme control and order. They desire perfectionism to the point that this strong urge interferes with actually completing a task. And they may have tendencies toward being unable to discard old or valueless objects. Both of these disorders, OCD and OCPD, fit Andrew to a T. Issues with the neighbors began to emerge here as well. When their next-door neighbor lost her dog, she asked Andrew if he had seen it. He matter-of-factly told her that he had seen the dog, burying a bone beside his fence, and he killed it. But the violence toward animals didn't end there. He was also known to drive his horses into the ground, and on one occasion, when an animal got too tired to work, he beat it to death. He had no problem admitting this to his neighbor and didn't seem to be bothered by the cruelty of the act. This, combined with his earlier killing of his half-sister's cat, demonstrates a profound lack of empathy for other living creatures, as well as what I would call a sadistic, violent streak and a need to dominate, control, and abuse a lesser animal. Andrew became active in the local farm bureaus, which was an organization that took care of the interests, both practical and economic, of the local farmers. He was elected to the board of directors in 1921, but seven months later, he quit and decided to run for a position that had more power. Around that time, in the early 1920s, the school system in the United States was being overhauled to encourage wider attendance in secondary school. A lot of the farmers in Bath did not understand why their children would need an education after eighth grade. Despite the initial pushback, a new school was built that would accommodate the 236 children from all the different counties to attend. Of course, the grand new school building cost money to be built, and that money was garnered from taxes. Andrew's farm was already not making much profit from the crops. He had to ask for an extension on his mortgage from Nellie's family. So when the new school tax was levied, Andrew was furious. Frustrated by the taxes and what he considered the poor management of the town's money, Andrew ran for and won a seat on the school board. There he took over as the treasurer and immediately started to clash with the school superintendent, Emery Hike. He felt that Hike was responsible for driving the taxes up even further by requesting books and other supplies for the school. With his power on the board, Andrew would punish Hike in various ways, like denying him vacations and forgetting to give him his paychecks on time. 
To Andrew, Hike was to blame for everything bad that had happened since the school was built. According to Grant Parker's book about the Bath Massacre, May Day, Andrew was jealous of the respect that Hike was given by the school board, teachers, parents, and students. And as a result, he would do anything to block Hike's power, including denying him the ability to fire teachers. As one member of the council put it, quote, Kehoe and Hike openly loathed one another. Beyond his role on the school board, Andrew had also taken on the role as the school's bookkeeper and unofficial handyman. This gave him access to all the school's property. However, in 1926, Andrew lost his re-election to the school board due to his issues with Hike and Andrew's overbearing nature. His party would not even nominate him as a candidate again. He was humiliated further when he chose to run for justice of the peace and was defeated by a large margin. A week later, his wife Nellie was admitted to the hospital after suffering from a multitude of symptoms, including migraines and violent coughing. This was the first of many hospitalizations to come and was an emotional and financial blow to Andrew, who had not paid his mortgage in four years. He had become convinced that he had been overcharged for the property and did not want to pay it. Bills continued to pile up, and seven months later, the lawyer for Nellie's family filed a foreclosure bill against the Kehoes. Upon learning that Nellie was ill, the lawyer tried to recall it, but the notice had already been served to Andrew. Upon receiving it, the sheriff later reported that Andrew said, quote, if it hadn't been for that $300 school tax, I might have paid off the mortgage. But Andrew blaming his entire financial situation on the taxes is just one example of his narcissism. He could have sold some of his farm equipment or crops, but he had let his farm become unkempt. Neighbors observed he had let the farm fall into a state of disrepair and the crops were rotting in the field. Narcissists rarely take the responsibility for a mistake or problem and love to shift the blame. In November of 1926, Andrew drove to Lansing and purchased two boxes of dynamite. He had also stored up 500 pounds of pyrotol, which was a powerful explosive that was available after World War I. Pyrotol was frequently used in conjunction with dynamite. After his electoral defeat, Andrew began to wire the basement of the school with explosives for months. His neighbors later reflected that he had dropped subtle clues of what he was planning. After a teacher asked if they could use the farm for a picnic for her students on May 19th, Andrew urged her to do it before on May 17th. I think he wanted the children to have some fun before he killed them. The day of the bombing, neighbors rushed to the Keyhole Farm to help put out the fire that was raging there. Fearing that there were people trapped inside, they raced toward the house. But once they reached it, they noticed that the house had been wired with dynamite and was burning from the inside. Andrew's car then appeared from out of the smoke and pulled up beside them. They described him as looking wild-eyed as he told them, quote, Boys, you are my friends, so you better get out of here. You better go down to the school. After the bombing, his wife's body was discovered in the charred remains of the house. Andrew had killed her and piled all of the family's prized possessions and all of her medical bills on top of her corpse. He had also ensured 
that he would completely annihilate his own farm, wiring the horses into their stalls so that even they could not escape the fire. After the bombing, people tried to figure out why Andrew Kehoe had committed such a heinous crime. The truth is, there is no single profile for the mass murderer. However, Dr. Stephen Diamond, a forensic psychologist and an expert in the psychology of mass murderers, evaluated violent offenders for 15 years for the California court system. And he came to a few conclusions about this type of killer. He wrote, and I quote, For me, the one underlying force influencing most violent behavior is pathological anger, rage, resentment, and embitterment. By pathological, he means anger that is over the top, excessive, destructive, debilitating, and abnormal. Dr. Diamond goes on to say, violent offenders in general, with the possible exception of those who commit impulsive and unpremeditated crimes of passion or suffer from some sudden medical crisis or neurological impairment, don't just snap. They slowly and insidiously bend, stew, simmer, and boil before erupting or exploding. Some are very good at hiding their feelings of rage and resentment from those around them. Diamond explains that for these types of killers, quote, the embitterment builds over time, becoming toxic and pathological. As this happens, the embitterment begins to become a fantasy, sometimes intrusive, such as an unwanted obsession. The fantasy itself, the content of the fantasy, is of exacting revenge on the people the killer perceives is to blame for his problems. If that fantasy continues to grow wild, unchecked or ignored, the vengeful murderous fantasies turn into reality. It is not unusual to see evidence of premeditation and significant planning of the massacres by these types of killers, primarily because they are mostly not seriously mentally ill or legally insane. They know what they are planning is wrong. Of course, there are exceptions to this, such as was seen by the two mass killers, James Holmes, who shot people in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and Jared Loeffner, who shot Gabby Giffords in Arizona. Both of those shooters suffered from schizophrenia. We look at this horrible crime and think, only a crazy person could do that. But Andrew Kehoe was not psychotic at all. In preparing for this story, I came across a fascinating psychiatric diagnosis known in Malaysia as running amok syndrome, which is actually noted in the DSM-4. During the incubatory stage of this syndrome, the perpetrator, almost always male, goes through a period of brooding, followed by an outburst of violent, aggressive, or homicidal behavior. According to Dr. Diamond, the amok syndrome tends to be precipitated by a perceived slight, or an insult, or humiliation, or rejection, or being defeated in some way, and the man seeks revenge and retaliation. The primitive response is fueled by festering anger, rage, resentment, and bitterness, which when denied, dissociated or repressed, becomes pathological and potentially destructive. Many of these types of violent offenders who run amok are subsequently diagnosed with schizophrenia or dissociative disorder, bipolar disorder, or some severe personality disorder. However, most are not psychotic and certainly do not meet the criteria for legal insanity. I think that description fits the Bath Massacre killer so well 
that perhaps they should call it Andrew Kehoe syndrome. On Sunday, May 22, 1927, as the citizens of Bath held the last of the funerals for the consolidated school bombing victims, more than 25,000 spectators came through the village in their automobiles to view the disaster scene. Many turned the occasion into an outing and spread picnic blankets on the roadways in and out of the village. One very morbid looky-loo snipped a piece of Andrew Kehoe's intestine from the steering wheel of his destroyed car and dropped it into a glass jar with formaldehyde. On Monday, May 23rd, the county authorities met for the coroner's inquest to fix the responsibility of the bombing to one man alone, Andrew Kehoe. The prosecuting attorney for the county was quoted in the papers as saying, while the evidence admitted is all circumstantial, it is of such an overwhelming nature that no jury could bring in anything but a guilty verdict against Kehoe. But I don't think that Andrew Kehoe believed he was guilty. He thought the blame lay solely with the school board, that they made him do it, and that he had no other choice. Why do I think that? Because after the bombing, the townsfolk found his final message to the world. He strapped a sign to his fence to ensure that it would not burn down with the rest of his house. It said, criminals are made, not born. This was Andrew Kehoe's final way to blame everyone else around him for the disaster he created. Next week on Killer Psyche, Susan Polk. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney. With research and editing assistance from Anne Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>